Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to be able to talk to you, although I'd much rather do it all in person. Um, I'm going to tell you about uh, some of our research in Heidelberg that's uh, related to drug discovery, and in particular will involve um, looking at uh, protein dynamics and binding kinetics. So one of the focuses of my group is to gain a molecular level understanding of drug kinetics through molecular simulation. And that involves thinking about the whole process from the drug molecule uh, being ingested um, through, uh, through to it being bound to its target receptor and beyond. And so we can think um, about a drug molecule and in order for it to be uh, suitably absorbed, uh, it has to be appropriately packaged. And one way of doing this is to uh, add excipient polymers. And traditionally, uh, suitable polymers for particular drugs are chosen um, basically by um, trial and error. Um, but we're trying to use molecular dynamic simulations to gain an understanding of the factors that are important in determining drug excipient polymer interactions and that will enable us to choose appropriate polymers for a given drug. Next, you have to think that drugs have to diffuse to their targets in the cell. And this means that they need to go through the cellular environment, which can be very crowded with macromolecules. And for this, we use Brownian and molecular dynamics uh, simulations. And then we have to think that drugs also have to be metabolized and so got rid of. And uh, one of the key enzymes for this is cytochrome P450, so defined in the liver. And so we've spent a number of years uh, modeling P450s, and in particular recently focused on using multi-resolution simulation approaches to uh, model how P450s interact with their electron transfer partners in uh, membranes. Um, so those are all important aspects, but of course, most of the time we think about focusing on the actual interaction of the uh, drug with its own receptor or several receptors. And this is, of course, the main uh, focus when one's doing virtual screening for drug design. And um, just while mentioning that, I want to draw your attention uh, to a method that um, has uh, just come out. Um, called RASPD Plus for rapid screening with physical chemical descriptors and machine learning. Uh, so the idea is that if you are following some sort of virtual screening pipeline where you have a big database of compounds that you want to screen against a given protein target, um, you might want to dock these compounds into uh, the target and then perhaps optimize the structures by simulations, uh, predict admit properties, and then go through a cycle iterating with the experiment to uh, come up with uh, interesting molecules. Uh, one of the problems is that even this molecular docking, if you're gonna dock many, many compounds, you can have millions of compounds in these databases um, or even billions, uh, this becomes very expensive computationally. And so one needs a way to pre-filter or pre-screen compounds before going to docking. And this is where we have used this RASPD plus uh, procedure. Um, in RASPD plus, we compute um, various properties of the ligands and of the receptor binding site. And then we try to look at the complementarity essentially between these two sets of properties without actually going through the work of docking the ligand into the protein. And then we look for these correlations with um, about uh, seven different uh, machine learning methods 
and then put those results together to make a prediction of uh, binding affinities. And while this is a very sort of cheap and quick and proximate method, uh, we find it's very useful for doing a pre-filtering in the sort of screening pipeline. And we we're using it routinely, like, like many of you probably against um, coronavirus protein targets, but also against uh, other uh, targets. Um, so, um, of course, in order to do such a study, we have to either identify the suitable protein target and also suitable um, structure of our protein target. And so one of the issues we have is um, in evaluating binding site drugability. Um, that means exploring the arrangements of the binding site and assessing their drugability. And I'm going to talk about how we do that with our TRAP, transient pockets in proteins, uh, software for analyzing the binding site dynamics. And what we've recently introduced this year is a drugability score uh, that can be used to score um, different conformations of a binding site. Um, now, typically, when one's doing some sort of a screening, one will assess uh, the um, how good a molecule is uh, based on its binding affinity as a surrogate for sort of activity. Um, but increasingly, it's recognized that the binding kinetics, including the rate of association and dissociation of the drug with its uh, target receptor, uh, is important for the drug's activity. And that's because, of course, we're looking at an open rather than a closed system. And so uh, we can have uh, non-equilibrium uh, processes. Um, and so we've focused a lot recently on trying to develop uh, methods to compute both association and dissociation rates uh, for drug protein uh, complexes. Um, uh, we have developed this small website called KB Box, so a toolbox for binding kinetics. Uh, which describes some of our methods, but also methods being developed all over the world. There's an awful lot of work going on, or has been going on over the last few years in terms of developing computational tools. And this is this website here, or KB Box, is designed as a, a sort of entry point to identify, well, to find these tools and to work out which uh, tools are appropriate for particular um, problem system. Um, what I will talk about today, though, in particular, is um, a one particular approach we've developed, which is called tau random acceleration molecular dynamics, which we use for computing dissociation rates. OK, so let's um, go back and look first at this issue of a binding site characterization and drugability. And if we take an example, so here is a picture of a model of a protein that we printed. Um, and uh, we can ask whether this protein is druggable. And you can see it's got a nice crevice here. Um, so that looks pretty promising. It's in fact a uh, kinase. And so it is druggable. But could we get this molecule in that binding site? And we could try to dock it in, but we'd find it wouldn't fit very well in here at all. Uh, even though this compound is actually an inhibitor of this particular kinase and would bind very nicely to this particular structure here, which is another crystal structure of the same protein. So the problem we have as computational people is if we only knew about this structure, could we predict this structure and therefore generate the information necessary to um, be able to um, identify this as druggable and indeed be able to bind to this particular molecule? Um, when we consider the, by, uh, the dynamics of a binding pocket, um, we can think that there are various different types of motion um, that can affect the drugability. So we can have sub pockets formed, which might be quite nice if we consider about consider introducing um, substituents into 
uh, molecules to improve their binding. Or we could consider adjacent pockets being exploited by sort of two pronged uh, molecules. Uh, we can consider breathing motions. Binding sites may be buried, only accessible by tunnels or channels. And there may be allosteric motions that affect uh, the, uh, the uh, shape of our pocket of interest. So for these different sort of types of changes in a protein binding pocket shape, uh, the underlying changes in the protein structure can be quite diverse. Um, so we can have changes ranging from small rotations of side chains through to changes in secondary structure or changes in protein domains. And these changes can take place obviously on different spatial scales, but also on a huge range of time scales. And we also have the problem that actually the binding or unbinding might take place on a time scale that is longer than uh, these motions I've just referred to. And so from a computational perspective, if we want to predict protein binding site dynamics, we have to deal with this huge range in time scale and all these different sorts of motions in the protein. And that makes it, of course, computationally challenging when you con consider that if we just do well, standard atomic detail simulations, we might be able to simulate these days, let's say to microseconds, but that's still yet yeah, not sufficient. Um, so when trap um, our um, problem is to consider the dynamics of a binding site and consider with this information, so if we can generate these dynamics, if we can consider whether it's druggable. And as I mentioned, we've introduced this druggability score in TRAP. This was largely the work of Chui Huang Huan, who did his master's studies in my group, and Daria Koch, who's a uh, senior postdoc in the group. Um, so TRAP, it's available as a web server or a standalone tool, um, goes with the idea that you know the region of the protein that you're interested with in, it, in initially. So it's not for de novo finding uh, binding pockets. Um, and if you identify this region, then TRAP will map out the shape of the pocket using a grid-based procedure. And then you can enter multiple confirmations or TRAP can generate confirmations for you, which will then be uh, clustered and then compared in terms of their structural variation or the residues uh, lining the pocket and various other properties. Um, and then if you say would analyze a, a set of uh, simulation snapshots, you could look for disappearing and appearing subpockets in, uh, in this main pocket. Uh, so to give us some concrete application, this is uh, an application that we uh, did um, as part of an anti-parasitic design project where we targeted the dihydrofolate reductase from a uh, trypanosomid, uh, trypanosomid cruci. And um, here's just one structure, but there are actually 27 crystal structures in the protein database at this time. And we could cluster them into four groups, uh, which had different residues lining uh, these uh, binding sites, uh, plot their different properties. And then we can, within TRAP, uh, compare sequences between on targets, these are the parasite enzymes, and a human off target identify a couple of residues that are different between on and off targets. And we can display them using our protein structure annotation tool, ProSat Plus, which is integrated into TRAP here, so that we can look at annotations of the effects of mutations on the 3 d well, while viewing the 3D structure. And we can see, for example, this, this phenylalanine here which differs from the methionine that you see in the parasite enzymes, is located next to a part of the subpocket that varies amongst this set of crystal structures. And indeed, um, if ligands occupy this region, they show better inhibitory activity against the parasite enzyme than the human one. 
Now that was just analyzing various different properties, but we really wanted to have a drugability score, which would give us sort of one number to say, if we looked at lots of different conformations of a protein, which ones might be druggable, especially if we were sort of starting from an undruggable uh, pocket. And initially we thought, well, there are many druggability scores out there developed by many different research groups. Couldn't we just use one of those? Um, but we found because we wanted to analyze um, a variation over a set of conformations um, using the grid-based information that we had computed in TRAP, uh, that we needed to develop, develop our own druggability score. And so this is what we did. Uh, we used a convolutional neural network. So in the way that you can analyze images, um, we actually analyze the binding pocket. And so we have a grid over a pocket and we can, as it were, color it by the different um, physical chemical properties of this pocket. And then we can feed these grids into a network, train them um, to predict druggable versus non-druggable. Now, one of the key problems in doing this is to actually have a good training set for this purpose. And so we used um, a training set that's available in the literature, but we found that in order to successfully train our convolutional neural network, we really needed to extend this with artificially defined negative labels. And so we did this actually in a sort of two-step procedure where initially we trained models using the global properties of the binding sites, essentially summing over the grid. And from these global properties, uh, we made predictions which could be used to extend our data set. So the initial data set we used is this um, non-redundant druggable and less druggable data set that is often used to derive druggability scores. Um, you can see uh, that um, the more druggable pockets tend to be larger and more hydrophobic than the undruggable ones. And when we train on these global properties, we generate here three different predictors uh, that reflect this uh, um, tendency for pocket volume and hydrophobicity to be uh, beneficial for druggability. Um, we then created this uh, druggability augmented from PDB bind data set or DAPB uh, training set, excuse me, um, uh, that uh, we have augmented so that we have many more instances of bindable or druggable versus less druggable uh, instances, um, which were derived from a support vector machine model. Um, you can see again in this whole data set, we again have the druggable pockets tending to have larger pockets that are more uh, hydrophobic. Um, and based on this larger data set, we could go through and train a CNN, a convolutional neural network, to make predictions. And this shows an example of uh, usage. And an important factor was that we wanted to have a druggability score that we could also understand that was sort of explainable. And so here I give an example where we have um, beta lactamase with a cryptic pocket that is closed here and open here. So the score goes from zero to one. So one means we predict this to be druggable by two different uh, methods. So a simple regression model and the, and the convolutional neural network. And here you can see this as a score near to zero. Um, so we started with this crystal structure here and actually generated possible um, structures of this pocket um, by using a tool that we have in TRAP called LRIP. And you can see as we go along here, um, we come to some more druggable arrangements. And you can see, in fact, that this one I'm showing you here has a very low deviation from this open form and that's shown down here. And what you can see at the bottom is these contributions to our models um, so that we can map out the contributions using these sort of global um, properties on a heat map. And we can also map them onto the pocket itself spatially. 
So blue basically means pretty bad for drugability and good mean, uh, red means good. And so you can see the pocket sort of went from blue to red. Um, often you get sort of more complex arrangements than this. Um, but this is largely because you can see, the, for example, the pocket volume uh, got better here, but also the arrangement of hydrogen-born donors and acceptors uh, is different in these uh, two different frames. So this drugability score in TRAP provides a way to assess uh, drugability, um, accounting for spatial information. Uh, the overall performance is equivalent to other state-of-the-art methods for drugability predictions. Um, we can apply this, though, to molecular dynamic snapshots as well as crystal structures, and we can visualize important regions uh, for drugability scores to be design. Now, I mentioned that we generated the um, structures of the binding site. And obviously, you can do these with classical explicit solvent molecular dynamic simulations. Um, but we wanted to have rather quick ways to do this in TRAP. And so we actually have four different methods. Um, and we wanted to have methods that would not just sample side chain motions, but also backbone uh, motions. And so uh, the approach that we developed for this is called LRIP for Langevin Rotomerically Induced Perturbation. It's based on, the based on this RIP method from Dave Egard that was originally developed to uh, look at um, allosteric motions in proteins. And here we have um, adapted it so that it will generate reasonable uh, confirmations of binding sites. And we see that the so the space sampled, the sort of binding site shape space sampled is similar to what you would get in a long uh, classical molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, the basic idea is that for each of the residues in the binding site, uh, we do um, a short sort of sim simulation protocol where we start by uh, putting the kinetic energy of this side, ch of this side chain into um, one of the rotations. And then we do implicit solvent simulations to um, let the system relax, and then we equilibrate it. And then we do that, as I said, for all of the uh, binding site residues. So I want to show you um, using one well-characterized system here, heat shock protein 90, uh, what we can uh, see for, this, for such a system. So this uh, is a domain of the protein that has been the target for um, many anti-cancer uh, compound uh, uh, campaigns. Um, this is the ATP binding site. And you can see there is one helix here, which is called alpha helix 3, that you see in crystal structures having a helical form or a loop in or a loop out uh, arrangement. And this changes the shape of the binding site. So this is obviously critical if you want to uh, dock molecules into this binding site. Uh, but it's also really important for the thermodynamics and kinetics of binding. And this is something we saw in studies done together with scientists at uh, MAP here in Darmstadt nearby, and also at Sanofi in Frankfurt. Um, where you can see for this set of 20 compounds, we have some, these black ones, that bind the protein when it's got this loop conformation, and the others bind to the protein with this helix here. And you can see, if you plot entropy versus enthalpy, that they have different characteristics. Uh, these loop binders are enthalpy dominant here. On the other hand, if you look at kinetics, on versus off rate, you see they're also separated. And you can see that the helix binders have much slower binding kinetics, as well as being entropy driven. So given the importance of this dynamics, um, we wanted to see whether we could uh, reproduce that uh, with our simulation techniques. And if you uh, simulate this uh, system with classical uh, molecular dynamics, starting from the helical arrangement, you see it's quite dynamic, but it doesn't change at least in sort of up to about a microsecond time scale. 
Um, but if we do the l perturbations, you can see, particularly if you perturb this residue here, 107, um, that you can sample these loop in and loop out conformations very well within a time scale overall of, of simulation of about 10 nanoseconds. So if you go around the residues around the binding site, you see some of them don't have much effect on the binding site shape. Um, and the greatest effect is uh, from this leucine 107, which prompted us to ask what would happen if we mutated it to alanine and run standard classical simulations uh, with the helix present or the loop present uh, and watch the deviation of the protein from the initial structure. And you can see that the deviation is much less in the mutant when you start with the helix than when you start with the loop. Um, however, the crystal structures of the APO protein both showed loop in, there was no difference. On the other hand, um, in Fourier transfer infrared experiments that Jürgen Gülkenhardt did in, in Bochum, he could see that there was more helical structure in the mutant uh, than the uh, wild type as we uh, expected. Um, and if you measure the standard and in kinetic properties, you can see that in the mutant, there is an effect with a tendency towards more enthalpy domination. The on rates become on average the same for the two conformations of the protein, but the off rates are still uh, split. So uh, what is also important is one can see for this system that the long residence times you have for these uh, types of, of compounds that bind to this helical conformation also are reflected on the uh, cellular level activity. Um, so given this, I'd like to now switch to ask the question, how could we actually uh, predict the kinetic uh, properties? Um, having you know, explored the binding site shape and tried to characterize durability, can we actually compute the kinetic properties? Um, and so um, how can we go about computing ligand receptor binding kinetics for drug protein complexes? Well, computing binding affinities, so there's a difference between the unbound and the bound state, is not particularly easy, but is something people have been trying to do for many, many years. When we come to consider the kinetics, we have even more challenges because we've got to consider that we may have in this simple model here, just one barrier, but we have um, a, a transition to overcome uh, between the unbound and the bound states. And so this poses challenges for scoring for the force field Force fields are generally trained on stable structures, not on transition states. Um, and we may have issues, particularly with the parameters for drug like molecules. Uh, furthermore, for sampling, um, we have to consider that the transition state may be uh, much less uh, well uh, defined. Uh, so we have many degrees of freedom, uh, large motions, and we've got long time scales. Uh, when we can consider um, that drugs may have residence times, say, on the time scale of hours. Um, so how can we deal with this problem? Um, I mean, obviously, in um, some cases, one can use brute force molecular dynamics and simply sort of count um, exit and entry events. Um, but for most cases, for drug-like molecules, this is not really going to be feasible. And so we need to consider some sort of enhanced sampling or when we have enough experimental data, even a sort of QSKR, quantitative structure kinetic relationships sort of approach. And so this is what we have done here, where we have adapted our combined analysis method for comparative binding energy analysis that we developed many years ago uh, for predicting binding affinities to predicting off rates. So this is the procedure that you can try to use when you have a fair amount of experimental data, uh, measurements of the kinetic property, the off rate here, of at least some tens of molecules, let's say. And then you have the um, crystal structure uh, or a structure from which you can generate models of protein ligand complexes. 
And then the basic idea is that you energy minimize structures, you partition the energies into different physical chemical components, and you can partition them based on um, per residue interactions. And then you try to correlate this with um, known binding kinetics from a sort of training set uh, with a uh, partial least squares regression procedure to generate a model to enable you to predict the off rate as a function of your uh, structure of your complexes. So for HSP90, we uh, were in a very fortunate situation of having a quite large data set measured all by surface plasma resonance. Um, by our collaborators. So in this case, we analyzed 70 different inhibitors and we could generate a combined model which allowed us to detect important interacting residues, mostly around the binding sites, some a little bit further away. Um, we could generate a quite nice predictive model. And this could tell us something about what was important for binding such as um, whether uh, we had quite large molecules, for example, here that interacted with this helic region and had long residence times. Whereas um, some of the loop binders, which uh, have shorter residence times, look quite a lot smaller, as you can see here. But also loop binders can have slower off rates, longer residence times, and make interactions with parts of protein here. Um, so this procedure can be used to derive QSKRs. We need to have a suitable training set. The compounds can be quite diverse, more diverse than for a binding affinity calculation. Um, it's a straightforward uh, type of calculation, um, but the model is based on the bound state. Uh, and so it does not, does not give us directly any information about the contribution of transition states or protein dynamics. So in order to look at this, we wanted to develop a procedure that would be something that we could use, say, in a lead optimization stage of uh, drug discovery that would be quite easy to use and quite uh, computationally efficient. And so this is this, uh, what we developed is this tau for residence time, a random acceleration molecular dynamics approach. And this is based on REMD, which is a method we developed some years back to try and find out how um, molecules can escape from buried binding sites in proteins. But in fact, you can use it for, so for surface exposed binding sites, and that's generally what we're doing here. So the basic idea is that you run a, a standard simulation, um, but you add an additional force onto the center of mass of your ligand in a random orientation you let the system run for a little while and then you look whether the ligand got stuck because it was sort of bumping into the walls of the protein binding site or whether it can have, is still moving and if it's getting stuck you choose a new direction for the force randomly and then you let it go and in this way um, you can um, simulate the ligand egress so that the egress takes place on a time scale of about nanoseconds um, and you make no assumptions about the ligand egress routes, so you can sample multiple egress routes. Um, and um, with the Tauramdi procedure, we generate lots of these trajectories. And from the statistics, you can look at when uh, the ligand goes out, and um, you can then uh, compute a sort of um, dissociation time and you can uh, monitor your statistics to ensure that you generate enough trajectories in order that you can have a reliable um, residence time computed. Um, and in this whole procedure, there's really a design, so there's a minimum adjustment of parameters. The user just needs to take care of the magnitude of the force. And we have a sort of protocol on how to choose that. And you can find a tutorial here in this um, KB box. Um, so here are three trajectories um, for ligands um, egressing from the um, HSP90 binding site. Um, you can see this one goes out pretty quickly underneath the helix. The other two take different routes and take longer to get out. And so the idea here is that although we um, will compute much uh, faster um, uh, off rates, than experimentally 
um, than the experimental ones, the idea is that we should capture the relative residence times. And so if we do that, then the simulated trajectory should contain information about the key features of the transition barrier. Um, and when we do these simulations, we generate a lot of trajectories with a lot of snapshots. And so the challenge is, of course, to extract important information about the determinants of the residence times uh, from all that data. And so what we've just uh, published is a method of doing this, which we call MDIFP, so Molecular Dynamics Interaction Fingerprints for analyzing protein ligand interaction fingerprints. So this uh, procedure and tools, which are all on GitHub, uh, can be used to analyze classical molecular dynamic simulations or these sort of egress simulations. Um, and what we're doing here is for any given structure, we generate a string of zeros and ones uh, describing the interactions um, between the ligand and the protein residues and whether they are, for example, hydrophilic or hydrogen bonding or whatever. And then with this uh, set of strings that we have for all the snapshots from all the simulations, we can perform a clustering in this sort of fingerprint space uh, to analyze the trajectories um, and identify metastable states. So in this example I'm showing here, we have eight different clusters. Uh, one is the bound state, one is the unbound state, and then there are different intermediate metastable states. And we can see here by looking at the flow between uh, the different clusters uh, that we can identify different pathways as the ligand goes uh, out, of the bind out of the binding site. So if we come back to HSP90, um, we initially analyzed this set of 70 compounds. Uh, they're very diverse. The colors indicate uh, different scaffolds. So we had 11 different sort of chemical scaffolds here. This is experimental on versus off rate. So you can see we have all sorts of different uh, types of kinetics, and not, not a direct correlation uh, with uh, binding affinity. Um, since then, we have uh, ex extended the data set. So this exists, uh, there are now a uh, data for 140 compounds, all measured by the same SPR, surface plasma resonance experiments. Um, so I think this is a very good uh, data set for um, validating our computation approaches. And if we compute our residence times versus experiment, you can see that for most of the compounds, we have a very good correlation. Um, one uh, class of compounds, you can see, had a uh, correlation on a different line. Uh, in general, we found that the outliers um, apparently had the stability of the bound state being underestimated in the molecular dynamic simulations. But on over, overall, if we then connect our residence time scale that we compute from the simulations with the experimental one, we can see that the average uncertainty is about a bit over twofold of the experimental value, about 0.7 kT. Um, it is, uh, in fact, more uh, accurate when we consider congeneric series. So amongst these 70 compounds, we can uh, detect uh, groups where we have high uh, tiny motor coefficients or looking at the um, effects of different substituents. So here there are two different places where the substituents, this one here going close to this helix that undergoes the transition to the loop. Um, and you can see in both cases we have a good correlation between computed and experimental uh, residence times. And that is also, even though for this case, for example, there is absolutely no correlation of the residence time with the binding affinity. And then we can explore the mechanisms of, and um, you can see here, for example, that the um, loop ones uh, tend to be um, slower in coming off than the, uh, sorry, other way around, the resident helix binders have um, long residence times compared to loop ones. And you can compare uh, the, here we have two examples where we have a short and a long residence time. You can see um, in this uh, fingerprint space um, 
that we have uh, more metastable states in this, uh, for this compound that has slower dissociation. And that's a sort of feature we see quite generally. Um, in uh, this case, uh, steric effects are particularly important in making the dissociation slower. And you can see that this compound has to uh, adjust its shape to get out underneath this helix. But we also see other effects like salt things, for example, contributing to transition state um, and therefore the um, uh, dissociation rate. Now, I just want to show you a few other systems we've looked at. So uh, here we can see an uh, application of this procedure to T4 lysozyme. So some time back, Brian Matthews uh, mutated T4 lysozyme to introduce small buried cavities where benzene or benzene-like molecules could bind. So mutating of this leucine to an alanine introduced this binding site for benzene. A mutation of this methionine introduced a more shallow uh, binding site where benzene can also bind. So this T4 lysozyme system has served as a sort of um, reference system for doing many different sorts of calculations to look at how uh, ligands uh, bind and unbind from their binding sites. And indeed, in this review that came out this year, um, we uh, looked at the results from about uh, 13 different studies with different computational techniques to look at how molecules get out of this binding site and to follow the different pathways. They identify up to eight different pathways between the different helices out of this protein. So we applied the um, Tauramdi approach to this system and we found many egress routes which were in accord with the other studies. Um, I show here in these movies, this is benzene going out of the L99A mutant. Um, there is a dominant pathway, which you'll see here, but there are other pathways. And you can see this ligand already escaped here. That was from the 102 mutant, where the ligands tend to go out uh, more uh, quickly. And we can see here that the residence time is uh, lower. Um, and that's also reflected in what we can compute. So we reproduce the residence time well over different compounds, different mutants, and also for measurements at different temperatures. Um, so in fact, we can somehow we, in the relative residence times, capture all of these different contributions. Uh, we also see, in fact, that these residence times um, the relative residence times can be well captured by considering uh, the dominant egress route, uh, even if all, not all of the routes are sampled. And we also see in this case that the faster dissociation um, from this uh, pocket made by the 102 mutation um, is associated with fewer populated intermediate states. Um, okay, sorry, that was just to show here, these are a few of the different routes we see out, and this is actually the, the dominant route. Um, now, okay, so now I just want to show you some applications to some other, perhaps more interesting targets when one considers drug discovery. Uh, so we looked at a number of different kinases. Kinases are quite challenging because of their highly dynamic uh, binding sites. And there are different types of binding that can be characterized as type one and type two as some main categories of binding. And for this particular kinase, you can see um, if you plot experimental off rates versus um, equilibrium dissociation rates, uh, you can see that um, they correlate quite well for type two, but uh, not for type one uh, compounds. Um, we could capture the um, relative residence times of both these cases, but needed to use a larger magnitude of random force for these uh, slower type one compounds. And we could see that uh, an important determinant of the residence time in the case of these type one compounds 
uh, was again a sort of a steric effect needing that was important for getting these compounds to go through this sort of quite narrow sort of channel uh, to dissociate from the protein. Um, another important target, uh, G-protein coupled uh, receptors, obviously important target for drugs. And um, they are also membrane proteins. Um, so we have to consider that these are embedded in a membrane. And interestingly, they can also have the binding of allosteric ligands, as you can see here, that can affect the resident times of the ligands shown here in cyan. And so you can see that in these experimental residence times, they can vary over quite a large range. Okay, here you can see with the shape filling how the allosteric ligands can uh, potentially hinder the egress out uh, to solution of the compounds. So we have also simulated these ones, and here I just show results for the M2 uh, uh, receptor here, um, shown here, computed with two different force magnitudes. Um, you can see that if the force is a bit higher, you get egress not only out to the aqueous solution, that would be up here, but also to some routes out to the membrane. Um, which may be artifacts. We don't know whether the ligand can go out in this way or not, um, but these are reduced when the force is lower. Um, regardless of the force magnitude here, the relative rates are well reproduced. Okay, so I'd like to sum up. We see that um, TARMD we find is quite a computationally efficient procedure that is quite easy to use. We recently implemented it in Gromax to take a, uh, advantage of the ability in Gromax to use GPUs and for parallelization, uh, which means that the implementation now is much more efficient for larger uh, proteins than was possible in our original studies uh, that we did with NAMD. Um, here we looked um, at uh, different simulation methods that have been published in the literature. So this is simulation time per compound versus the experimental residence time and it's sort of as information about how much computation time you need to invest with the different methods to compute residence times. Um, and you can see that so TARAMD is one of the more efficient procedures, only this targeted molecular dynamics uh, is faster. Um, the timing, uh, the time needed also um, only sort of increases modestly as you go to uh, long residence times here. Um, of course, with Tarandi, um, you have to apply your random force in a reasonable way, and you need to make sure you do a suitable number of replicas. Um, but this is all um, sort of uh, described in this protocol you can find in this uh, KB box. Um, we have noted that it's particularly sensitive to having a good quality model of the binding pose. And so this is really critical, um, and, but that often uh, sampling the dominant pathway can be enough to obtain relative residence times. Um, I'll point you just one more time to this KB box because this um, website has um, many different tools described in it and I would encourage you if you're working in this area to um, contribute um, information about your papers or even tutorials, we would welcome contributions to this. Um, also in an attempt to make tools available to the community, we are within the human brain project uh, developing a so-called eBrains platform. This is work also together with Modesto Resco in Barcelona and Paolo Caloni in Jülich um, to make uh, tools such as these to compute parameters, but also more generally to do simulations uh, in the context of a multi-scale modeling up from the molecular level through cellular level and well beyond in, in the case here in brain studies. But of course, many of these tools are more generally applicable um, and so this includes things like uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, with various different wo workflows um, that we hope will be useful to the community. <laughs>
Okay, so with that, I hope I've uh, given you some idea of um, some of the tools we're using and the tools we're trying to develop uh, to look at dynamic protein binding sites and to compute the kinetics of drug-like molecules binding uh, to proteins. Um, I'd like to thank all the group members who contributed. Uh, this was us in the summer trying to have a suitably socially distanced um, group outing. Um, most of this work that I've described has been done by Daria Koch. She was the main person behind the TRAP and Tal Ramdi methods. Um, but Ariane Nunes Alves, a postdoc in the group, has done quite a lot of the work on the um, dissociation rate calculations. And Gautam Mukherjee, another postdoc in the group, has been the main person uh, behind the RASPD plus method. And all of these other people have uh, contributed um, in various ways to the projects I have described at HITS and also our collaborators on both the experimental side and on the computational side. So, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>